Well, good morning, everyone. It's about one minute to 10. I'm glad to see we have a dozen attendees and hopefully a few more will join us shortly. This is gonna be a short, uh, shorter talk than usual. And uh, you're in for a little bit of a treat at the end, an interesting slideshow that's about uh, almost 15 years old from France. And um, uh, it's accompanied by music and we can just flip through some slides for about five minutes. And I think you'll enjoy them. The reason that, that I added this topic because we've talked about the ocean several times before, but I got a um, science magazine. You can see it here on the right side of your slide dated May the 28th of this year. And it it's, shows in the left lower corner, protecting corals, local actions defend reefs against climate change. And I thought that would be an interesting topic. And so I immediately put it on the list and didn't think much more about it until the summer was well on its way and the agenda was all developed. And I realized that the paper inside uh, was a paper written by Mary Donovan uh, entitled, let's check on the official title here. Local conditions magnify coral loss after marine, marine heat waves. And so uh, it's a very complex topic and with remarkable statistical analysis. I took statistics in graduate school and this left me behind in the dust uh, as I was starting to read it. And I decided I need to simplify it a lot. By the time I did that, I had only had a half a dozen slides. And so I added some in um, and I'll introduce those to you uh, as time goes along, but I only have a 30 slide total. So we'll have a, a fairly short uh, official talk and then look at these slides. We should be all wrapped up in an hour or so. And we can take questions probably after the, the little slideshow of, of uh, undersea life. So the subtitle for this uh, new approaches for saving our coral reefs is local reef management might help to ameliorate the impacts of marine heat waves. And so let's dive in. Um, first of all, there are some contradictions in the sense that corals provide us with vast resources, but their existence is threatened by our own stresses. And that's even beyond warming and acidification that we've talked about so many times. We continue to pollute the oceans terribly um, the 10 worst rivers that pollute the oceans, oceans are, in the, are in India and nearby, but we also do invasive uh, damage, invasive species, particularly with drag netting, and we overfish terribly. You hear me teasing um, about the, uh, I think last week I made some wisecracks about uh, Greenpeace, and um, um, they are extreme, but the one good thing they do is they patrol heavily uh, for overfishing and I have to recognize and appreciate what they do there. So to introduce you, let's um, talk about two aspects of corals. There are the deep corals and then the corals that we all know about that many of, of uh, which we've, we've swum over as we've done a little bit of snorkeling or even scuba diving. And that's, so I'll focus on these superficial corals first. The ability of corals to build reefs depends on nutritional symbiosis between the coral animal and an intracellular plant referred to as a single celled microalgae. And if the microalgae is allowed to die because of temperature or pH, you'll first get bleaching. And then if that bleaching persists, you'll get death because there is a, is a dependency, the animal depends on the microalgae. Uh, the brown circles in the left photo are algae creating nutrients for corals. And so these are algae that are uh, growing. I don't know the details of the anatomy there, but, but what you see uh, in that aspect of the coral is a look down through the tentacles of the 
of the algae that are inside the coral uh, shell. The bands on the right photographs are dark bands. They're being pointed out by three little vertical red arrows, and they represent um, uh, light availability periods to the coral, how, how uh, it grows and changes with different uh, light availability. The details beyond that, I don't know much about. I'm not a marine biologist, so I haven't really studied that, but I find it an interesting symbiotic relationship and it explains a lot that we know about corals that uh, are in reefs that are building reefs. But there are another whole family of corals, I shouldn't call it a family, but a, a variety of corals uh, that we'll talk about later. Uh, obviously, the corals are suffering because of the rise in ocean temperatures. We've seen a lot of air temperature curves, but this one shows a relentless rise. This shows that uh, they've taken the zero point as the, um, an average around the time of World War II uh, or thereabouts, what some people call the beginning of the Anthropocene, although people argue about when that really started. Um, but you can see that as uh, the world has recovered from World War II, um, we've gone through uh, a reversal of the Great Depression with uh, lots of commercial activity leading to the rise in temperatures. Um, the last temperature recorded there is 2015, so it's uh, six years old, but it's been going up relentlessly since then. And so the temperature has gone up uh, by now practically a degree in the ocean temperatures above what is considered the median over the past century and a half. And this is happening globally. Um, there are slight differences in temperature from one part of the ocean to the other, of course, depending on whether it's um, tropical or polar, but it's so this is a global average. And uh, the following research study cites uh, uh, for studying corals, they have already bleached to some degree. So I'll lead right into the paper. Now, this is where, this is why it was such a massive study. There were 223 sites for studying coral cover. Uh, and again, this is post bleaching. So these were chosen uh, in tropical waters uh, where there was, there was known to be some bleaching. It ranges from the Strait of Hormuz to Mauritius, um, this is um, the Maldives and up to Japan here, down to the southern to mid, mid parts of getting somewhat temperate here in Australia. Uh, uh, Hawaii is up there. They didn't leave, they left Hawaii alone. They went over to do Central America, Jamaica, a little bit on the Florida Keys, um, Curacao and so on. So all these sites are within a hundred kilometers of each other. And I'm sorry, the ones that were within 100 kilometers are fused as one circle. The size of each blue circle is correlated with the number of sites. And you can see that key up at the top. So this is a lot of analysis. And <clears throat> I've divided the results into two slides. The first thing they noticed was that sea urchins can become so abundant on some reefs that they suppress corals by direct predation and by erosion of the reef matrix. And you can see a particular sea urchin here called the diadem uh, and a, a little uh, shrimp next to him sitting on the coral. And uh, sometimes if they're too numerous, they do some damage. It's an interesting portrayal of the five-fold symmetry of this echinoderm. And uh, uh, so it's the, the, for some reason or other in this image, uh, the sea urchin I think has been turned on an angle so that you can see that. Um, the important thing in understanding this Part of the data is that DHW stands for degree heat week. So it's a cumulative number that is based upon the heat stresses that the coral suffered not only in the past, but in the, in the present time that as they were being analyzed. They were analyzed by a model called Bayesian hierarchical uh, and that tried to predict uh, the change in coral cover. 
Anything to the left of this dashed line is a negative influence. And I have not shown you all the data, it's bewildering, but I've only shown you the top part of the table showing that in these corals that have been stressed before, that the degree heat weeks uh, is a very strong negative effect, not too surprising. These are show the standard errors and the standard deviations. So it's, it's way off uh, uh, this, this marker. So it's a very negative effect. Macroalgae, I'll show you in a moment what they look like as opposed to microalgae. Uh, they're basically kelp and other seaweeds. Um, then when they're, when they're coupled together as cofactors, there's a powerful negative effect and the sea urchins uh, also, but that's only within a certain range. And the range is shown here. If you look at urchin abundance, uh, it's not bad if they're, if they're in moderate numbers. You can see that the change in coral cover doesn't change very much. But as you increase the numbers, uh, their abundance in um, um, 100 square meters, they, uh, they have a more negative effect. Um, so a high abundance of either sea urchins or macroalgae increased coral mortality after coral bleaching is the basic uh, conclusion or result. And this is a picture of what some macroalgae look like, They're usually seaweeds, including kelp. Uh, this is a picture of, a, of an example that is having um, uh, asexual reproduction as well as sexual reproduction through production of sperm and eggs. And then these uh, egg cells uh, can come down and settle on a uh, um, dead mollusk and grow in that sort of a fashion. So in the conclusion, <clears throat> these observations help us recognize <clears throat> that beyond slowing climate change, we need to empower local communities to manage reef and other marine resources as well. So the main focus up until now when we've talked about corals in the oceans has been to slow climate change because of the acidification as well as the temperature. Um, and so that's the urgent need and, and they, they make that point here very clearly. So um, uh, let's get out of there. Uh, okay, going back, back one. So that's the basic story of that paper. And lacking more information, I decided to go to the National Academy of Science and look at what they had to say on the subject. And they talked about four interventions. Um, and of the four, I chose the one in the upper left because I thought to me, they were the most interesting about genetic and reproductive uh, interventions. And so I've, I've gone through, I think it was about a hundred page document and I just showed this one table to limit your exposure so you won't fall, I'll fall asleep on me. Uh, this is table 6.1 and it shows an overview of interventions examined in this report. If we go down the left column, you can see all the various things that one can do. One can just manage the selection, that is the heat will have selected some survivors um, and you can increase the frequency of that with, with existing tolerance genes and and look at the feasibility in the laboratory. Um, but it, it's limited because it needs large populations and there is a risk that you might decrease some of the genetic variation. So that's one intervention. Then you can look at managed breeding, supportive breeding. And you can look at managed breeding by outcrossing between populations or by hybridizing between species or by collecting gametes and larvae and seeding them. Or finally, by just cryopreserving them and all these different aspects of the current feasibility, potential scale, limitations and risks. Um, so they all have their pluses and minuses. And I think they advocate all of those approaches in the long run uh, to uh, help understand the whole concept of coral bleaching and how we can manage the corals and support them uh, even while the oceans are warming and acidifying. A couple of findings from the Academy Committee is that new knowledge in ecology, molecular biology, and stress responses provide some practical short-term interventions. And they say the current approaches are important, but not adequate. We may need to move coral colonies, they say, or try selective breeding, as summarized here. 
Now, I've talked about these bottom two quite a bit, how limiting fishing, we talked about that last spring in reviewing a book called Sea Future, I think it was called. And uh, uh, we've talked about the absorption of CO2 worldwide. What I'm gonna focus on here are these three. We we'll start with relocation of corals, then about carbon fixation on sandy beaches, and finally expanding marine sanctuaries. Always interesting to look at. And there's so much bad news today. Uh, in the news where do you, people seem to find it not newsworthy. And so we don't hear about some of the good things that are happening, and I'm happy to share some of those with you today. Well, in terms of relocating, we have a little map here of Hawaii. You can see Big Island and Maui and these other uh, small islands, and Oahu is what we're interested in here. The northeastern shoreline has become, um, for various reasons, I think they wanted to give you army divers some experience, and they they allowed they trained them and had them do some. Uh, removal of coral from a donor site here on this little offshore island. And this is the transplant site over here. So they didn't have to go very far uh, to build a new mature colony. And um, we see a few more pictures of that. Uh, this is a before after picture, 2006 uh, and six years later, it shows a line through, uh, a line just to orient people uh, to a location. And in this location, coral regrowth had an obvious increase in fish size and abundance. We don't see much in the way of fish size here, but certainly the corals uh, did grow as presumably was in the same site A and B. And so they looked at, uh, at it, but they noticed that you have to have transplant them to a good site for coral regrowth. If it's a marginal site in the first place, it won't do so well. The other thing that <coughs> intrigues me is this idea of carbon fixation. There is a material called olivine. You can see it here uh, figuratively resting on the floor of the beach and here causing the beach to be a bit green. You can pulverize olivine rocks and apply them onto beaches worldwide. <clears throat> There's quite a study on this. I looked at the details, very complex again. Um, but they came to the conclusion in one research study that every pound of sand will take up about a pound of CO2 and keep it buried in a stable fashion. So you don't have to worry about this carbon capture and storage business that we do when we um, take the CO2 gas. In this case, the carbon dioxide is in the air. It's absorbed very rapidly and readily into the water. And with water, of course, it ionizes into hydrogen atoms and, and bicarbonate atoms. And the hydrogen atoms get selectively picked up by this. Uh, rather alkaline mineral called olivine. Now it's not that different from quartz, but it does have a different characteristic. It is more alkaline. And the idea is to pulverize it. Well, that means you have to input some energy here to start with, and you have to get those particles fairly small, or this will take a long time to happen. But if you get it into the size of what would be typical sand particles, it'll take about a hundred years uh, somewhere between 100 and 200 years to do its job of taking up all the CO2 that it's going to take up. So it's, it's sort of a, a nice way to stabilize it. The whole question is, uh, can, what's the optimum size? Uh, does it have any negative effects? They've done a little bit of research and found that uh, nickel can be, ions can be, uh, or even I think just the ions, can be released and might be somewhat damaging to some uh, marine life. And so they want to research that before they start doing it in any greater degree. Uh, there's a whole question of how much energy is spent crushing it. Uh, you'd have to have um, some um, ready source of energy in a fairly concentrated fashion to, in a, in a um, climate friendly way, uh, not releasing further CO2, uh, you'd have to find a way to do that pulverizing. So, I thought it was an interesting idea. It obviously needs some, some work and how reasonable that would be to scale it up is uh, probably not gonna happen anytime soon to any large degree, but you never know. It's, it's, uh, to me, it was an intriguing thought. I like the idea that you can just uh, pour sand on a beach and, and relax for 100 or 200 years 
and uh, not be put off by the green color of the sand. Uh, anyway, it's, it's a thought. The third thing we're gonna talk about today is preventing coral loss within sanctuaries. Uh, this is an atoll in Kiribati, one of the most pristine in our oceans. And the question is how to care for it. Uh, the most obvious solution is to include it among our marine sanctuaries. Um, you probably have heard of Kiribati because uh, at the COP26 meeting, representatives from there were uh, pointing out that their island, um, as you can see, will go underwater if the oceans are allowed to rise uh, more. And we've seen examples of that as we go around the Pacific Ocean and see some reefs that are already submerged um, uh, that were sometimes dropped because of um, shifting in the Earth's crust below and sometimes uh, uh, shifting in the ocean level. So uh, that could be going underwater and that would of course um, not necessarily destroy the island. It would, would make it a nice, uh, the whole thing would become a reef. But um, we just have to get off it so far as people are concerned and leave it for the fish. This is a better article that I found in National Geographic um, a few years ago. Uh, and it covers nicely the shelters in a changing ocean. And they focus on um, some protected areas that are shaded in green. And they, they focus in particular uh, about this part of Hawaii. We just think of these islands from Hawaii up to Kauai here. Uh, in this area, extending all the way up to, to Midway here, um, is all a collection of little islands and reefs that uh, have been militarized, some of them, for a while and used as, uh, as uh, sort of support bases for aircraft and naval ships, um, but mostly left alone. And there's some biological stations on most of them. And now uh, people are recognizing the importance of the reefs offshore. And so uh, uh, they mention uh, that former President uh, uh, Bush Jr. Uh, declared this area as a, as a protected monument, they call it. And uh, this was enlarged to half a million square miles uh, from uh, where, where um, Bush had it, but it was enlarged another half a million by uh, Obama. And since he grew up in Hawaii, I suppose he had an attachment. Uh, but there are some other fascinating uh, protected areas around Wake Island, Johnson Atoll. You've heard of probably of the Palmyra Atoll, Jarvis Island. This is where uh, Amelia Earhart is thought to have <clears throat> crashed and her plane got underwater here in Howland Island. Nobody knows for sure because it's the clear wreckage is not available. But those are some uh, five important areas. Also, the Marianas Trench has been made into, by Bush, I believe, <coughs> a, a monument. And that's quite interesting because of the um, active undersea volcanoes and hot springs there. Over to the to the right off the coast of, of uh, San Diego uh, is Cortez Reef and Tanner Bank. And uh, I'll show you some slides of that in a few minutes. Um, really beautiful area just off uh, the coast of California. There are some others in the Caribbean, but I focused on these because that's where most of the photographs that I'm going to show you were taken. This is the Cortez Bank of San Diego. It's risen a, to a mile, it's about a mile off above the seafloor. The seamount diverts nutrient rich deep water to the surface, helping to create fertile oases here. <clears throat> you can see the giant kelp forest with the holdfasts uh, to, the, to the coral and then um, providing uh, uh, a good environment along with the coral <clears throat> for um, tropical fish. You can see here, uh, Obama added again, almost uh, over three quarters of a million square miles to these protective waters. And here's a picture of him taking a break from the Oval Office. He made the comment as he was here that Teddy Roosevelt used to take months off to go and explore the Western part of the United States. And he figured he had a, uh, it was only fair that he take a, a weekend off at least, or a week maybe to uh, enjoy this part of Hawaii that he enlarged. We don't very often see him out of a, 
out of a suit. So that was an interesting shot. Okay, coming now to uh, a totally different kind of coral. <clears throat> this is black coral. I put a question mark because uh, black corals are any color but black uh, when they're alive. We only see them as fragments that are turned black when they come up to the surface. Um, but they, they grow perfectly well without an algal symbiont and they grow at any depth. Along with them here, sort of stealing the show, are narwhal shrimp, sometimes called unicorn shrimp because of their prominent nostrum that's a sort of a orangey brown color in between their two long antennae. They interact with one another, so these long antenna or tentacles, and uh, they're nocturnal, but they're vulnerable to deep drag nets. Now, I've been bemoaning the lack of orange roughy off of New Zealand, and one of the attendees here, a former classmate of mine, Dr. Caldwell, reassured me that the orange roughy, which were totally destroyed for a while as a fishing industry, are coming back, and he's absolutely right. Uh, my wife bought some orange roughy recently, and we enjoyed having them, but I was a bit guilty because I realized that um, the more we eat them, the more of a market there will be for them, and the more they might be doing um, dragnets. So I, I get, have a tinge of guilt when I eat this delicious fish. But anyway, this is uh, an interesting little shrimp that I include in there. Um, before we leave the, uh, uh, the subject, we do need to acknowledge seagrass. Uh, this is protected by mangroves, and you'll often see it along uh, the coast of Florida in, in the inland waterway and elsewhere. In the, um, wherever you see it uh, in a tropical or semi-tropical location, there's some amazing statistics that I didn't read, know about before. Apparently, an acre of seagrass can produce 50,000 liters of oxygen per day. Um, overall, the oceans provide half of our oxygen, the trees the other half, and it's said to be, some people say more than half comes from the ocean. Uh, obviously, it can't happen, uh, come out of the open ocean or the deep ocean, but there's a lot of uh, seagrass and other uh, uh, photosynthetic organisms that are releasing oxygen. <clears throat> it also will support 40,000 fish and 50 million invertebrates. So those are pretty important just from an acre of the stuff. Um, I don't know how they came up with this third point that it absorbs nutrients from sewage of 100 people per year, but I guess they run that calculation of what it could do uh, based upon its absorption criteria and uh, a certain amount of carbon and that it uh, forms general valuable ecological services. I think most of that is related to the top two, but it can have a problem. If you overnourish it, you can uh, uh, have a problem. And China found that they had uh, way too much of it. And it was uh, blanketing as a, a macroalgae, as we talked before, it was blanketing some of the coral reef. Now I'm going to tell you about one of my marine heroes, Sylvia Earle. Some, most of you may have heard of her. She's world-renowned expert in marine biology, the first woman to lead the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. She advocates for ocean conservation and education, and she has a, um, a webinar every second Thursday about five o'clock in the afternoon central time. And I've been listening to it for a while, taking some slides from the people she's interviewed, and I'll show a few of them here. Just to, I won't read all the details, but you can see she's had more than 20, 200 publications and had 100 marine expeditions. She's many honorary degrees and honors was Time Magazine's first hero for the planet and uh, is uh, awarded a TED Prize. So she's done very well. I think she's born in the early 30s. She has a daughter. She's been married three times. I think uh, some of her husbands have just um, had a problem. They've been in scientists many times, but um, when it's just like in Hollywood, when you get very, very busy with a career, sometimes there's not enough room for the marriage. So. She's been through three husbands, but the first one's name was Taylor. And so a daughter that she had by the first husband was uh, called Elizabeth. So when she's interviewing various people, she and Liz Taylor, as, as they call herself, who's also a marine biologist, uh, have a, a three-week conversation usually with the guest and showing various slides. And it's, it's a very laid back hour or so 
I, if some of you are interested, I can send you the link, but you can probably find it by just Googling her name. And, uh, but if, if you have any trouble finding it, let me know, I'll send you a link. So this is one of her uh, guest speakers, Dr. Dee Dee Witter. And she lives uh, not too far south, I think, of Cape Canaveral. And so this is the intercoastal waterway. And here would be the beaches and the people are living on this, on this uh, sandbar. And you can see where they're concentrated because these are the individual lots and you can see the red, which is a high amount of nitrogen or nitrate in the water. Uh, and it, it uh, in according to this key here, uh, it gets cleaner and cleaner as you get out into the center of the, of the intercoastal waterway. Um, I'm not sure exactly where Didi lives, but it would be somewhere along here where it's not so, so uh, congested. And I have a picture of her house uh, before she bought it here on the left and after she'd had a bit of time there. Uh, and you can see there is another house next door and the pictures are not exactly the same. So over on the right, you can see this house in a different perspective. Uh, possibly this tree or another one nearby is, is visible here. But notice what she's done. She's taken away the, uh, the fence, first of all. She's allowed free drainage of water that comes off the roof and uh, from off the street into this. And so it can percolate gradually through uh, not solid cement or docks, but uh, a calcium carbonate um, uh, blocks of limestone and uh, filter its way uh, into the ocean so that it's not so um, toxic and carrying off uh, waste off the street um, and relating to human habitation. She's done quite a bit of diving and these particular uh, deep corals were taken in the Sea of Cortez. Uh, we're familiar with corals and shallow reefs, but uh, these corals can adapt to dark quite well as shown here about 400 feet down. Uh, rather pretty corals, feathery, some little coelenterates here and various other uh, little critters. But you notice that they're all highlighted by the, by the intense uh, sources of light that she brought with her so she could, you could see this at night. And uh, the ocean looks very dark and mysterious in the background. So she shut off her light and this is what she saw. And she was expecting some bioluminescence but not to the extent seen in this image. It really shocked her. And she says it's important for coral communication in the dark. But on further analysis, uh, she thinks it's more than just communication, that it's involved in predation. We saw some of that in the movie Nemo with those little spotlights and some of those critters that Nemo saw as based of, in, on some fact and reproduction as well, searching for potential mates. Uh, I added, so this is her slide where she collected various little creatures uh, pointing out that not all the bioluminescence is blue green, some of it is yellowish orange. Um, Unfortunately, my talking here has obscured a, a very cute little, that helps it. No, it doesn't help it any, uh, but th there's, a, there's a little jelly here and you can see just the outer rim of the jelly and um, uh, it's quite luminous and intriguing. So I just stuck that little picture in, I came across it recently. So um, moving on uh, to this one. Um, I'm just going to double check. Yeah, that is the next slide. Um, excuse me while I get rid of that. Um, she also interviewed Jeff Kirshner. Uh, some of you may have heard of him. He's founder and CEO of Literati. It's a global community working to create a litter-free planet. And uh, here are some of his workers uh, selectively removing what they think is important uh, for later analysis. And this is an example of the analysis done under a dissecting microscope. And um, he can, uh, and some of his experts can tell where these came from based upon the size and shape and character of these um, pieces of plastic pollution. So he's going at it from a scientific point of view, has a wide uh, army of people around the world uh, collecting this plastic and we're trying to uh, do more than just collect, but identify and prevent um, more and more of the pollution that's taking place with plastics. So that was another one, but they, they just come up every couple of weeks with good talk. 
Well, finally, I'm, before I get to the, to the little entertainment, uh, just a summary of coral reefs and the numbers that are associated with them. It's estimated that 6 million coral reef fishers are busy fishing off of the reefs and uh, they can handle a certain amount. I don't know how much, but I would guess that 6 million is pushing it a bit, especially considering the uh, uh, temperature and acidification of the oceans. But um, so that, that's one number to characterize. Uh, here's one where you can multiply by a thousand and put a dollar sign in front. So $6 billion is what the fisheries are valued at, um, I think globally. Um, and of course, uh, climate change is, uh, and overfishing are the big impacts. Coming down to the left, what have researchers found globally? They found that the capacity of coral reefs to provide ecosystem services declined by 50% in the last 70 years. Catches of coral reef associated fish peaked 18, 19 years ago and are continuing to decline. Global coverage of living coral has declined by a half in 70 years. Catch per unit effort has decreased by 60%. Catch per unit effort is an interesting uh, parameter. It makes it uh, perhaps a little more realistic, meaningful. 63% of coral reef associated biodiversity is declined. And this degradation of coral reefs and associated loss of biodiversity is projected to continue. So coming to the right side of the slide, what can we do? Well, we can stop warming the ocean, obviously. Uh, and we, we made some promises over the last two weeks in Glasgow uh, or Edinburgh, I guess it was. And um, hopefully we can live up to some of them. I noticed that India is the only country that said they don't want to make any promises by 2050. They made all their promises by 2070. They, they feel they need another 20 years. Well, I suppose considering that their rivers are the 10 worst polluted rivers on the planet, uh, they probably do need an extra 10 years, but I don't feel that the prime minister has his heart in it. Um, and uh, I think he's uh, very mixed in his enthusiasm about uh, the whole conference. Anyway, a globally coordinated effort is what we need um, and address needs at local scales as well. We need an integrated plan. And at the local level, we make sure that water quality runoff is appropriately managed. So there are many, many ways of looking at it. Um, the question you might ask me is, uh, are there any favorites? And I don't wanna go out uh, on a limb saying that one group is better than another. I think before you make any donations, you should get a, there is a journal that my wife subscribes to on um, uh, sort of a guide for philanthropy philanthropy and it's updated every year or two and the all the organizations in the world and you they're they're associated by uh, social value nature value and so on um, and they're scored from a to f just like a teacher would score a pupil and there are quite a number of criteria involved in the scoring um, but I, I, I recommend that because some of these organizations just turn around and send you out some address labels. And if that's what they spend most of their time doing, uh, then they're, they're just uh, not doing very much for the oceans. Uh, an organization that I've enjoyed working with and I've mentioned before because I, I respect what they're doing, it may not be the best, but I, I, I'm happy with what I see so far is called the Ocean Conservancy. They're sort of the oceanic version of the Nature Conservancy. And uh, I've enjoyed working with them. I try and point out to them the value of nuclear energy over wind and solar, but only when they get talking along those lines. I don't think I've convinced them of my argument, but uh, I think it at least could be used in, in dealing with ocean acidification in terms of the power density of that source of energy and its lack of inter intermittency. Uh, but uh, so I, don't, I haven't made a, a win with them, but I don't find that they're against nuclear in particular, and so I continue to support them. Well, let's go now to, and then we'll take questions. Let's go now to the um, Haute de la Mer. This is a uh, French for hosts of the ocean. And I'm going to try to stop screen share for a moment. 
and see if I can. Give me a moment, be patient with me. Louise helped me through this a minute ago and I managed to get it. Let's try. Let's try that one. I may have to come off and come back on. So uh, forgive me. I'll see what we can do here. I think I'm going to have to. Uh, so just bear with me a minute. Need to unmute myself. Is that showing up? Uh, not yet, Richard. Okay, let's try screen sharing. Huh. It's not showing up on my screen. This is frustrating. It worked for us before, didn't it, Louise? <laughs> I am the witness. There we are. Yeah, but we're not seeing the slideshow. Um, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. Let's see if I can get this. It is there. Okay. You're not seeing me yet, though, right? We, no. no, we heard the music briefly. Oh, okay, well, that's good. That's a sign. Uh, I just need to get it. I'll try one more time here and see if we can get it to come. Is it showing up now? No. Because oh, it's showing up for me, but I don't have the sound. There comes the sound, but it's not showing up for you. I don't think you're screen sharing. Uh -huh. Okay. Let's. Uh... Okay. Unfortunately. Hmm. Hmm. 
the problem I'm having is that when I screen share, the Haute de la Mer doesn't show up. Okay, now I've got it. Are you seeing it? I think you are. Yes, we are. Good. We do it. All right. Let's uh, see if we can get it to go. Working? Yes. Good. This is a sea dragon, exists mostly between Australia and Tasmania, an amazing relative of the seahorse. Renato Margapetti is the artist, photographer, and then he drew shot. Barracuda, of course, for those who are familiar with that critter.
And the uh, remark at the end is, are we going to sacrifice this paradise in order to assuage the uh, greed of certain um, other kinds of beasts? Uh, so that's a question that we uh, can ask ourselves. Coming now to, um, back to our share screen. We've got some chat questions. And um, we have lots of attendees. Glad to see you all there. Let's uh, deal with the first question on chat. I think it's, it's not showing up. Let's try uh, and hand raise. Nothing there. Question and answer. No open questions. You're all struck by the photography. Um, Lewis's microphone is available if he would like to ask his question that he posted in the chat. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. So would you, uh, I think George Erickson maybe and Lou Harnish, um, I, I don't see them. So could somebody read them out or the individual ask? I can read it to you. Yes, please, George. Um, I, you mentioned an agency that ranks um, charities yes. that you that you rely on it would be helpful if you would uh, mail that link to the group yes. email it yes i can do that thank you for that suggestion um by the way let me just if you've got a half a second let me just get it okay just hang on Yeah, I, I have it right here, George. Uh, it's called Charity Watch. Um, it's a program of the American Institute of Philanthropy. Um, let's see. They, you can um, call 773-529-2300 or email membership at charitywatch.org. They have a postal address in Chicago. I'll read that again. Membership at charitywatch, all one word, dot org. And they, uh, they come up with, uh, can you see me? I guess you can. They come up with uh, um, child protection, child sponsorship, cancer, consumer protection, civil rights, environment. Um, we have the Cousteau Society, for example. Uh, let's see what they give the Ocean Conservancy. Uh, they give them a B. Um, so it's okay, but uh, League of Conservation Voters gets an A plus. So uh, they're, they're different. Greenpeace, <laughs> they don't rate them at all. I get an NR. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, Earth Justice gets an A minus, so on. These are the, this, this is the table. You can't read it obviously, but you can see how um, these things are rated. And this is the front cover. And she's uh, bursting the egg, busting the myths, the overhead myth. People talk about how much they have to spend on overhead and uh, these people don't buy it. Um, they don't need to be sending out address labels um, and that sort of thing to keep their and dedicate their money to the causes that they're supposed to be doing. Does that answer your question, George? Yeah, thank you. I have one other comment. Yes. Um, you touched on energy when you spoke about, uh, let us say, salting the beaches with crushed olivine, Correct. and that's appropriate. Um, but it brings to mind the fact that 
almost never do I hear the word carbon footprint. Whenever you hear people talking about schemes to um, capture and uh, sequestrate carbon dioxide or some of these others that are going to re remedy the damage to ocean reefs and so forth. And I think we have to start with uh, carbon footprint because unless we know what it is for the, whatever the project is compared to what it's going to yield, uh, we could be shooting ourselves in the foot with some of these things, but you don't hear about that. You're quite right. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, it's uh, um, people just assume that um, there's all kinds of green energy around. And I think in this, we have one more talk this fall, but in the spring, I want to encourage a, a group of us to have um, a discussion. We might have some of them, unfortunately, when we, if, if we go to open discussions, which I'm hoping to get because I like that method of interaction at Oakwood, uh, we, we uh, eliminate people like you, George, and because you're away in, in the next state, Minnesota. But um, uh, I want to have a conversation about hydrogen. Um, regular hydrogen is called gray hydrogen. Uh, then there's blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, orange hydrogen, and magenta hydrogen, depending <laughs> on how you make it. And uh, that's a classic example. We keep talking about storing the energy in this wonderful material hydrogen, and it hasn't really been assessed yet. I've invited uh, Doug um, Edwards to talk about it, and he's, he's indicated that he might. Uh, so maybe we can um, get him to uh, interact with us in the spring. Um, I don't see if I see him on the on our list of attendees today, but um, uh, anyway, I, it's a it's a very good point that you raised, George, and I'm um, I'm glad you brought it up again. Thank you. What about Lou? Lou, take, unmute yourself if you can. If you have a question, should be down in the lower left corner. You might be able to hit a little mute thing and unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, um, my question is kind of basic, but uh, how do invertebrates and fish support the coral ecosystem? And obviously they're gonna add CO2 and acidity since they're animals, um, but uh, probably small amounts compared to what's going on with global warming. Um, but how do they round out that ecosystem, coral ecosystem? Well, that is a good question, Lou, and I'm not a marine biologist, but what I can say is that an awful lot of, of important um, marine life uh, depends on calcium carbonate for a shell, a protective shell, and that includes coral, Includes oysters, which is an important fishing industry. Um, all of the uh, um, crustaceans and uh, vast variety of sea life, even the krill, uh, I think, needs a certain degree of chitin and calcium carbonate. Um, chitin, of course, is a protein. Calcium carbonate is the salt, but uh, I think the krill probably needs them both, but I, I don't know enough about the krill anatomy to judge. But I think that um, there is quite an interaction between the pH of the oceans and the, um, and that's of course dependent on the CO2 that's being taken up very readily into the water uh, from the air. And the, um, the pH, of course, you cannot make um, a shell if the pH gets much um, lower than, I think about 7.8 or so. I think they stopped making shells. It's uh, The oceans should be 8.2 when we're originally. They've come down in acidification to 8.1. Uh, Alex Canara talks about 8.0 as a danger point. And I think if, uh, if it we're much below 8.0 into the 7.8, 7.9 range, you would just have uh, uh, lousy shells being made 
on um, most of the undersea life and including the corals. So I mentioned the krill because um, that's independent of the corals that we've been talking about today. That has the basis, they are living under the polar ice at the South Pole and elsewhere. Uh, and they make a very important uh, source of food for the whole food chain. So uh, that's a very important one. And how much uh, they are determined or modified by the pH, I'm not sure, but certainly the corals are, and um, uh, it's a crucial uh, aspect. And so we can look for mutants that are temperature sensitive or temperature resistant. Such mutants are a little easy, easier to find in the history of bacteriology and virology. I'm not sure that it's as easy to find mutants that uh, are resistant to low pH. Just don't know enough about that. But I know when I end up talking to biologists uh, about uh, corals, they focus a lot more on temperature than they do on pH. And I'm not sure if that's because they, they're professional focus or whether it's uh, not as much of a problem. Uh, I don't know. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm very concerned one, about both of them. Okay, one other point to make. Uh, the previous gentleman uh, George. mentioned something. George mentioned the uh, carbon footprint. And NASA has scientists, has sa satellites that are showing where the carbon plumes are being generated over the course of a year. And it really <laughs> is very quite, quite traumatic if you haven't seen those. Um, uh, but also from a satellite, they show unicellular um, algae, diatoms, or that bloom when the CO2 gets sort of high in regional areas of the ocean, and they're going to take the CO2 out. Um, I mean, is there some way to maybe control these blooms? Of course, they get runaway. You know, all, all algal, algal blooms get runaway. And um, I don't know if there is a way to control that, to follow the, the, the plumes um, from satellite in some way to control some of this stuff. And, and this is a large scale. It would be a huge project to try to, to handle, you know. Yeah. Uh, why don't you send us some of the, or send me and I'll forward it to our group, Lou, some of those links, uh, especially if you are familiar with how to reach them and uh, pass them along. Would you do oh, that? Sure, I'll try to do that. Thank you. Good, thank you. I see Margie's name up there. Margie, do you have a question or a comment to make? If you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I wrote it. I was wondering whether you have the names of what the slideshow was showing. The names uh, of the no, the no, I'm afraid not. Um, um, but I can. Um, uh, I might be able to do it with you, Margie. Um, if we could zoom together, <laughs> and uh, that might be fun to do. And uh, and then I could talk over the music. I didn't want to do that today. I only made interrupted the. Uh, with one name, the sea dragon, because I thought that was such a spectacular critter, one of my favorites. But uh, most of the, the ones that are not too recognizable in terms of the invertebrates are the nudibranchs. And uh, they are, of course, very primitive uh, chordates that, that uh, in the same phylum uh, as we are, but they don't have a vertebra and they only have a cord, sort of a spinal cord at certain stages in their natural history. Uh, but they, they love uh, tropical waters and they hang out and there were a couple of photographs of nudibranchs there so that you look at these things and you wonder what on earth are they? They look like a body of a snail with these little antennas sticking out and you're not sure what direction they're going to go in. Um, the other ones, of course, uh, um, I don't really know all of the marine fish, but um, I'm probably a little more, mm, I don't know, um, a little more acquainted with them as a result of uh, my interest in Cousteau and other people who've been underwater. Um, the, the, the fish with the large, there were quite a few images of fish with large, looked like blades of fins going out in all directions. And that was a famous lionfish. There were quite a few of those. And then uh, the rest of them, I'm really not sure. 
what they were called. I thought one of the most interesting pictures was one of a shark swimming away from us. And he was covered with little fish. And those are remoras. Um, most of they have little adhesion-like pads above their heads. And they like to hang on to a shark um, right near the lower jaw or near the mandible. So they catch some of the debris um, that the shark misses as he's uh, gorging on some fish or other. And um, so they were shown in a spectacular way in that image because the shark was swimming away and all these remoras were the ones hanging onto the tail, um, getting a free ride and maybe a free lunch someday if they're lucky. Uh, there were quite a few other ones, but uh, um, the other thing is I could just send you, the, anybody who wants that, I think I can send it through the email. And if any of you want to feel free to write to me and I'll send that whole thing to you. And then maybe when I'm, uh, we can talk about it someday as we're looking at it and uh, identify some more things. Will that do, Margie? That would be great, thanks. Okay. Anybody else out there with questions? It's five after 11, we've got lots of time. Um, I do want to um, uh, let you know that I'm, I'm still um, looking into meeting at Oakwood. I will miss some of you, Lou, you're from Chicago area and, and um, uh, George, George, you're from Minnesota and we would miss you very much um, unless we could get you to come up and give a talk at Oakwood. That would be a possibility, a bit of a drive for both of you. Um, George, I know you have come on your way back and forth from Florida in the old days and you gave us a talk on unintended consequences, which we enjoyed. Um, but, uh, and what we might do is do a hybrid thing where we do a couple of, uh, of uh, presentations to the whole group via Zoom and uh, perhaps uh, over half I would like to do at Oakwood if they will, uh, if, if COVID will settle down enough by next spring for us to work there. I know they have been having a few courses and things there now at Oakwood. And I like it because there's just so much of more of an opportunity to have an interaction with uh, people that are in the same room. It's just a little more, a little handier. But on the other hand, <coughs> I um, sometimes have to take pleasure in, in, the, in what uh, COVID forces us to do because I would never have thought of Zooming these meetings if it hadn't been for COVID. And, and they have offered, given some new opportunities. A classmate of mine from Victoria is uh, listening in and uh, lots of people from out of town. So uh, that's kind of nice. Robert Havens, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, um, I have a thought for you. My wife, Judy, uh, teaches reminiscent writing in Plato. Uh -huh. And they're doing a hybrid now, which means that she meets with her class in person, but three or four people do not come. And they have a setup in the class where those people at home can see what's going on. And um, this has all been worked out by the people in Plato. So that might be another option for you uh, to include some people who don't feel like they can come or can't actually come because of distance. That's a great idea. Can you tell me what the name of that group is that your wife uh, participates uh, in? Yeah, it's Reminiscent Writing. Oh, yes, you did say that, yeah. And her coordinator with the um, Plato is Paul Thompson. Sure, I know Paul well, sure. Yeah. So, it's just another thought um, that might work. Yeah, and you would call at, uh, uh, what, what, what would be the name you would give that? that they, they're hybrid? calling it a hybrid. It's a hybrid, okay. Yeah. I will raise that question. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Louise with us now from Plato and she's taking notes, I'm sure as well. So we can, uh, have a conversation with 
Plato and see if we can do that. Now, where where is uh, where is reminiscent writing held at the moment? Senior Center. Ah, uh -huh, that's a special situation. Um, uh, but who knows? We could possibly go down there. I well, prefer... I'm not sure that it would matter. Um, uh, I, I think don't be... know what the technology is that yes. would be needed, and whether Oakwood, you know, somehow could provide that. I just don't. You yeah. know, obviously, I don't right. know. Well, we'll look into that. Thank you for raising that. Sure, I appreciate Lynn, that. Lynn right. Green also has the comment. Right, yes. Dennis Dreesing, Richard is also doing a hybrid on Tuesday mornings and he uses Oakwood and it, it's worked out really well. Oh, good. Who does that? Dennis Dreesing's class on Tuesday mornings, the one he Dennis? does with Terry Sheldon. Dennis Dreesing? Wither, Wither the State. Okay, yes, I remember that title. What's his I, last name again, Dennis's uh, last name? Dreesing. D-R-E-S-A-N-G. Okay, thank you. And That's he's um, actually sustained a lot of people who stay on Zoom, but he does get a group at Oakwood. Excellent, and he does them both at the same time. Yes, yeah, it's a hybrid and it's worked really well because he's had a lot of presenters who are presenting via Zoom or you know whatever technology, so. Um, Good. And yes, does he, great. when he meets at Oakwood, does he meet in the big uh, conference room? Education? Yes, yes, Good. he does. Yep. Excellent. And they have the technology to do this. Excellent. I'm so glad. Now, they do not uh, record, though, I think. Correct? Um, you got me there, Richard. Yeah, yeah I think they don't. But that's that's OK. Uh, although the recording is a nice a nice feature of, uh, of Zoom. We're, we're the. Well, there, there are only two uh, Plato groups, I think, that you meet by Google, and I'm sorry, by Zoom. And um, I feel we're honored to have that capacity because I, I like the uh, um, features in, in Zoom. Let's see, thank you very much, Lynn. Appreciate your input on that. Any others have any conversations, thoughts about uh, marine biology, about um, corals, about uh, next spring. I, I've already registered that we're gonna, gonna have 10 sessions starting on February the 22nd, I think, and going through uh, yeah, starting on February the 21st, the Monday, and the 10th and last session will be um, on April the 25th, on Monday. So uh, that's already in the works, um, but we need uh, to have some ideas. So I'm gonna uh, possibly send out a list. I might ask Tony to help me with the list and send it around to everyone and let you uh, vote maybe on the things that you're most likely to, to participate in. If you would like to be a discussant, uh, maybe a group leader to um, help so I don't spend so much time preparing lectures and it can be just more of a discussion group. I know they do that very well at the um, global affairs meetings. They uh, have a good uh, active discussion uh, with, every, with every meeting. Uh, I believe Dr. Erickson had a comment. Yes, George. Yeah, hi, Richard. Yeah. Um, before we go, I wanted to mention that last night MSNBC had on a program that, uh, let's say it examined the accident at the, the Susanna Research Facility in California years ago. And it was a, I recorded it because um, I was busy and I've only had a chance to watch part of it. But the part that I saw, this, it was a terrible job like amateurs do on Chernobyl. Um, yeah. with no statistics, no um, talk about um, radiation exposure to the degree what the what the real harm might have been. Um, and if any of you have the capability of uh, bringing that back up, that was on Central Time, I think at nine last night, MSNBC. And uh, after you watch it, I think you'll 
want to send MSNBC a response because all of their, it was almost as if they'd uh, uh, adopted the old LNT uh, limits. And uh, even though they didn't specify anything like that, it was based on hearsay from people who were afraid of anything amounting to radiation. And it was a very poor program. Thank you for letting us know about that, George. I appreciate it. I'm, uh, uh, I find those programs so depressing that I don't search them out very much uh, because they're, uh, you know, they're just so discouraging to see the bad mouthing continue uh, and leading to the prejudice that we see so often in the general public. I make a point of asking almost everyone I meet, even if I'm hiring a gardener, I'll say, I don't use it as a criterion of whether or not I hire them, but I do um, uh, try to educate them a little bit because uh, I ask them, what do they think about nuclear energy? And we get into a um, very interesting conversations. So um, uh, I, I can take your, your point to heart. Let me, in response to your remark, uh, tell you uh, some good news that I don't think many people listening hear about. We've been hearing about all the negative things about COP26, but apparently there was a meeting, an unofficial meeting between a high ranking representative from the United States and a high ranking representative from China. And at this meeting, they decided to overcome and bypass some of the conflict between the two countries. And China made the statement, it wasn't a promise, it was simply a statement that they planned to build 15 nuclear reactors every year for 10 years across China so that they can start to shut down their coal plants and their coal mining. And uh, I found that encouraging. 150 reactors in 10 years, starting apparently immediately, uh, would be a great boon to the uh, pollution that China is, is uh, not a boon, but a great inhibitor of the pollution that China is contributing to the world. I found that very good news. Uh, nobody picked up on it, interestingly. Um, never saw it in any of the news commentation, any of the, I've seen several reports and discussion groups on COP26, never heard it anywhere else. But uh, I thought I would share that with you. I'm more of a purveyor of good news. Um, and uh, I just sort of cry when I hear about the, um, the faults bad news that continues to give uh, nuclear energy a bad name. It's not that every energy source is perfect. There's no perfect source. Everything, every source has its problems and it's not that nuclear is without problems, but when they're exaggerated and distorted to the point of uh, even intelligent people like Al Gore, um, uh, placing it in a, in a pretty negative connotation or the or the Drawdown website, which I find amazingly thorough until you get to nuclear energy when it's a very, very meek uh, admission that yes, nuclear energy is dense, period. Uh, so um, it's, uh, it's interesting, the spectrum of attitudes. And I think that uh, I was really encouraged to see that in China, they don't worry too much about public attitudes. They just do what they think needs doing. And in this case, it was a good thing. So I. I share that good news with you. Dorothy wanted to bring in something from the presentation. Yes. Yeah. Um, I wanted to return to the stuff about the corals. I've missed various things because of technological problems with Zoom. So I'm hoping I'm not repeating something, but I wondered how successful are the attempts at reseeding corals um, is this a practical approach or is it going to be too labor intensive as a means for maintaining corals? Yeah, that's a good question. I did touch on that fairly early on where I talked about the U.S. Navy in Hawaii. Did you see that slide? Um, I, I did see various information about reseeding, but I'm not sure you talked about how successful a strategy that is. Okay, uh, well, let me relate more specifically to your question and let you know that in that particular instance uh, that, that was, uh, went from 2006 to 2012, 
um, that they used in 2006, uh, Navy, U.S. Navy divers, or, or I guess they were Army divers, actually, uh, wanting to learn the experience of underwater um, work. And they volunteered their time to take corals um, from the coast, the northeast coast of Oahu, and transplant them. It looked to me like it was no more than a mile offshore. And they had a circular area uh, where they were doing the planting. And I showed a before and after image and showed how the coral had uh, done well over the six years. And they claimed, although you didn't see it in the picture, a lot of uh, uh, fish diversity. Uh, that's just one example. They did stipulate quite clearly in that example um, that um, uh, you have to find a suitable site, that if you're not careful in selecting uh, a, 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 a site to receive the coral um, transplants, that they wouldn't thrive there. And so you have to good, be a good um, marine biologist and understand the, the um, hydrology and the currents and turbidity and all those other variables that affect coral survival when you make that decision. Uh, to answer your question more broadly, um, the Ocean Conservancy has guided me to a number of instances where work is being done off of Florida, off the Florida Keys and elsewhere uh, on coral transplantation. And I think it's been pretty effective. Sometimes they, they hang the branches of coral on little strings until they get a certain size and then they attach them to a, sometimes to a metallic uh, grid to give them dome-like support that will supposedly uh, increase the exposure of the little baby coral branches uh, and allow a nice dome to form that might take uh, perhaps decades less than who would otherwise. So they're giving, given a helping hand. And um, I think that's perfectly fine there is, some people would say, well, it's a waste of time because the oceans are going to acidify and get hot and, and all that effort is going to go to naught. Um, the, the emphasis in this article was that um, local action, um, defend reefs against climate change was the subheading uh, on this science article. And so I think that uh, a certain amount of it is helpful in selected sites. I think uh, I think we can learn things from it, and we can learn um, from the localized actions that we take and their successes. What needs to be done in a more expanded environment? So um, I think it's worthwhile, and that was the whole theme of the of the science article. But um, but it's not a it's not the grand solution. Obviously, the grand solution is to is to uh, get our, our emissions down to zero so that the CO2 will, will uh, start to very slowly drop. I think the question was asked, I think it was in this group. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. Somebody asked, how long is it gonna take for the um, CO2 levels to start coming down? And I pointed out that because of the CO2 lasting so long, um, centuries to millennia, that um, it might take a hundred or more years to start seeing the levels go down. So the, the, the essence of that talk of uh, Bill Gates was that we not only have to look at the carbon emissions, which he really focused on, but we have to look at the Keeling curve to see how reducing our emissions is actually working at the global level. And then we have to look at the actual temperatures. So there are three parameters to be following in terms of the overall health, not only of the planet, but of the oceans. And uh, um, so and, and those are the big things. But overall, I would say the article that I focused on here defends local reef actions as well, uh, up to a point, but with wisdom and understanding. So that, that's the best answer I have for you, Dorothy. Does that help? It helps. Okay, good. Lou, I think you're there again. Lou, or, or are you? If you no, I, I'm, I'm not. Uh, okay. I have no other questions. Okay. okay. Let me spend a minute or two 
on uh, uh, Richard. Yes. Um, I'd like to comment in the last uh, question sure. about how long it will take for carbon dioxide levels to come down, if that yes. was correct. Absolutely. Um, what I read says that uh, the oceans have already absorbed one third of the non-natural carbon dioxide that we have emitted. That leaves two thirds um, yet to be absorbed. So I think um, it's a little oh, hopeful, let's say, to talk about them coming down with it. Because not only because we've got two thirds remaining, we're adding something like, um, if I remember right, 50 to 60 billion tons of carbon dioxide to the year, uh, to the atmosphere every year. So we're making matters worse uh, on a grand scale. Um, and I think that's something we really need to understand. You're quite right. You hearken back to the bathtub model. Are you familiar with the bathtub model, George? Vaguely, but uh, I'd be happy to hear a review. <laughs> yeah. Why don't we put that on the agenda? Um, it's, a, it's an interesting idea and relates very much to what you say. Uh, there was also something in to one of today's slides, um, uh, and that was the olivine story. Um, when I looked into some of the research done, they point out that as, as you absorb the hydrogen ions from ionized water onto the olivine to reduce the pH because those uh, hydrogen ions uh, bind with the alkaline minerals in olivine. Um, it just pulls more CO2 from the air into the water. So the water acts, of the ocean acts as a, as a vehicle for um, bringing some of the CO2 out of the air into the ocean where it can be deposited in some way. And of course, that's where, uh, um, that's a, a, in a way a natural cycle, but I thought it was an interesting way that olivine can be used as a, as a binding site for hydrogen atoms, ions over a couple of hundred years. Um, I just don't know how well it can be scaled up and how well we can use energy that's carbon free to do the grinding of the olivine. Um, but they were, they were very cautious in the research uh, done as I looked at it, they were concerned about uh, possible damage and side effects from nickel ions, I believe, and, and other physical properties of the sand of the uh, olivine. But um, anyway, there are a lot of unknowns and we need to, we need to maybe get a good geologist or something like that to uh, uh, talk to us about, or geochemist about the uh, problems of, of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and how soon we can see it go. I welcome your, your um, comments though, George, and I think we shouldn't be um, too blasé or, or um, about it and realize that it's, it's a large problem. One of the things I, I'm gonna just mention in closing, this book I'll be talking about next week, and it's a book by Larissa Zimbaroff called Technically Food. Inside Silicon Valley's mission to change what we eat, I think it's it's good because um, it's one of the few things we can do. You know, we can talk all we want about uh, preserving nuclear plants and and uh, preserving oceans and corals, but there's not an awful lot we can do other than send money to organizations that feel the same way. Um, but this is something we can all do as individuals in altering our diet, and uh, there, there, we can, of course, we heard from Tony. Uh, about uh, recycling, uh, but um, if you, I don't know, I don't think I, I put it in one of the slides to you folks, and maybe I should send it around. It was, it's not a very accurate thing, but it shows that recycling is a pretty minor point, and uh, diet is a much bigger point in personal choices that we make uh, to help the planet. So, um, so I'm looking forward to. Uh, 
uh, presenting that individual challenge to all of you next week um, of uh, changing our diet somewhat so that we can be kinder to the planet. Um, so that with that introduction, unless I see, I see Dorothy with another comment there, let's hear from you. Yes, I would like to say about food, I'm hoping that you will focus somewhat on a natural diet. I'm a little bit appalled by fake food myself. I think that there's a lot of attempt to make something seem like it's something else and add a lot of additives and preservatives and a variety of things. And I'm wondering if we couldn't all focus on a more natural diet that's less meat-based. That's just my personal comment. Okay, thank you for that advice. I will definitely include that. I can't exclude it because Larissa does, uh, she lives in Silicon Valley and she knows all these major manufacturers like Impossible Beef and Beyond Beef and she knows them and has been going to meetings with them for about 10 years. So she's become personally involved and uh, she doesn't address what you just suggested very well. But, uh, but I, I will uh, touch on that, but I, I think it's, it's a good point that you make. Uh, who wants to be uh, uh, getting prepared foods when we don't know uh, what else is in them that we don't want to have there? So, um, uh, and, and I do have a couple of slides, one of them in particular, on how much it would uh, reduce our carbon footprint if we just didn't eat certain things. Like um, if we did not eat beef and uh, lamb, or if we re decreased our intake of beef and lamb by half, what would it do? I thought, I, I don't know who's done those calculations, but I thought that they're intriguing and I plan to share those with you next week. So have a good week, everybody. Thank you for your input, all of you and for attending, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, we've had, uh, got 15 of us this week, so that's good. And I'll hope that we can uh, sustain that and uh, come up with any final thoughts a week from today. So thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed those little fish images. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>